I am delighted to have as guests for our calcium imaging uh, meetup, Alexander Fleischmann, Associate Professor in the Department of Neuroscience, and Chris Deister, who is a Research Associate in the Department of Neuroscience. Alex, please take it away. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Jason, for, for the invitation to join this methods meetup today. Very happy to be here. Um, I thought I could start by just very briefly summarizing why we image, what we hope to learn from calcium imaging experiments, and, and state uh, what I think are a few of the important challenges uh, and where critical development has been happening recently. And, and, and Chris will, will uh, come back to that in his introduction. So I'll, I'll quickly share my one um, slide. And so you may or may not see, this is a movie, a typical calcium imaging experiment performed in the lab. These are cells in the olfactory cortex of a mouse imaged uh, using green lens technology and two photon microscopy. And so why, why do we image? Um, we want to understand how neural circuits, ensembles of neurons detect and process sensory information and how, how they use this information to ultimately drive a behavioral response. And understanding these neural correlates of behavior, we think, is one of the fascinating yet unresolved questions in neuros neuroscience, and imaging has the potential to reveal uh, some of its secrets. Now, what do we want from imaging? We want to monitor neural activity at the cellular level. We want high resolution and speed. And we want many cells. We want large uh, fields of view, large volumes, great depth. And, and these parameters are primarily constrained by imaging technology and calcium sensors. Chris will briefly introduce some of these constraints in more detail. Um, we have great genetic tools in mice uh, to identify and label different types of neurons. And so we can visualize different types, different cell types using fluorescent markers. And so we want to image uh, using multiple colors. And if we want to understand transformation of sensory stimuli into behavior, we need to image in awake behaving mice in our case, and ideally over extended uh, periods of time chronically. And finally, we need to transform calcium imaging data into quantitative outputs uh, from which we can generate quantitative measures of information coding. And and so I think these are some of the key points that define the strengths and limitations of imaging experiments and highlight some of the key areas of methodology development in our lab and in the field uh, more generally. And, and I think with this, um, I'll, I'll have Chris take over. Great, thanks. So Chris, please. Great. Um, so just to carry, carry on with the, that, um, so Alex sort of sketched a really nice you know, big picture, why we, why we want to image and the ambitions for the techniques that calcium imaging has sort of evolved into. Um, but calcium imaging has been around for some time and it's had humble beginnings in, in single neurons trying to understand, that in, in single cells really, and trying to understand basics of calcium dynamics. And so there's a smattering of calcium indicators that are appropriate for specific things. So you don't just have to image spike-related calcium in the overall cytosol of some neuron, but there are calcium indicators that are tuned to look at subcellular compartments reasonably well, or really low concentrations of calcium, high concentrations of calcium. And, but they're all based on a buffer. So they're all based on endogenous calcium buffers and how they work. So most of the events that we want to use calcium as a proxy for, it really is just that, it's a proxy. And it's a proxy that has its own temporal dynamics. And that is something that we have to take into account uh, when we're analyzing that data. So if we're interested in action potentials and using calcium imaging as a readout for action potentials, we have to know a little bit about how its buffering dynamics are so that we can actually re you know, pull out the spikes that we care about and we don't get uh, our data contaminated by artifacts of just basic calcium dynamics or saturation and things like this. Um, so I just wanted to highlight some of that stuff. Um, and, but I also just want to mention, because there's a variety of indicators, both genetically encoded and chemical, uh, the ability to get them into single cells, one part of the brain, one part of the body, or the whole animal exists. And this is a really great review. 
Uh, I'm going to link, Jason's going to uh, pop a link to a folder full of papers that I re refer to, but are also just helpful calcium imaging references you can look at later. But I highly recommend this review. It does a pretty good uh, broad overview. Um, but the, the basic point I want to make is that as long as we understand how the event that we care about relates to the calcium influx and the ultimate signal that we're reading out with our calcium indicator, our exogenous buffer, then we can reconstruct those events pretty readily. And there's a ton of software packages that help with this problem. So if we know that when an action potential happens, this is the calcium influx that's related to that action potential, but then our indicator has this time course is a little bit slower. Uh, that's indicated by this delta F. We can use this to then reconstruct when action potentials actually happened. So this is two examples from the, the famous GCAMP6 paper, which is referred to here. Um, and this just shows how a pyramidal neurons in the cortex fire uh, just, just spontaneously in relationship to a calcium, these genetically encoded calcium indicators. So there's two different ones here that have different sensitivities to so give you slightly different results. But both of these indicators are reasonably good for these cell types at detecting single spikes in addition to a few spikes happening in a, a short period of time. But they, their sensitivity to single spikes differs pretty markedly. And that's something that I, I want people to keep in mind when they approach their, their calcium imaging experiment, because while we can reconstruct the events pretty well, as long as we know these transforms, or even if we don't, software is pretty good now at, at inferring what that transform probably is. Um, but what we can't fix is if we chose the wrong indicator when we did the experiment. So it, it's very useful. You don't have to become a, a calcium biophysics aficionado per se, but if you just pay attention to a couple of things as you're reading papers and looking at these different indicators, um, I think it, it'll help you design your experiment appropriately. So these data came from this GCAMP6 paper and all these uh, papers that talk about calcium sensors, both genetic or chemical, are always going to disclose, measure what, what's called the KD, uh, which is roughly uh, speaking, tells you about uh, what concentration that your sensor is going to be half saturated. And then this Hill coefficient, which is just the slope of this line. And using the Hill equation, which is listed here, you could easily plot this out and you can look at the range over which this sensor is appropriate for detecting calcium. So we know in most neurons that calcium tends to range from base resting calcium ranges from 20 to 250 in animal or so. And usually in pyramidal cells, at least when there's a single action potential, you get about a 200 nanomolar change in, in cytosolic calcium. And so that's what this dashed line is indicating here. So what this dashed line tells us is that both our GCAMP 6S, this black line, or this GCAMP 6F are going to give us a, a appreciable change in brightness for a single action potential. But the GCAMP 6 is much better. It's close to 80% of its maximal brightness, even for a single spike. The problem is, is that if you just added yet another spike or two in a short succession, you're gonna saturate the indicator. So if you're interested in high balance of activity or high concentrations of calcium, this would be a poor choice for you. And then the GCAMP 6F would be better. And this is just a practical example of this here, which is, this is just a different type of neuron reported than the one I showed you before. This is just an inhibitory cell. And these inhibitory cells have low resting calcium. So they are, live closer to the foot of these curves. And so when there's a single spike, this indicator does a pretty poor job of reporting it. But when there's a lot of spikes, in this case, there's an event that 41 spikes in a burst, it detected it pretty well without really saturating. And so just keep these things in mind as you're approaching your experiment in the first place, because it's relatively easy to back out the basics that you need, um, but it, it, it determines whether or not your experiment's gonna be successful or not. Um, and then I, I just wanna close with this slide, which is a bit complicated, but the only reason I pointed it out here is that um, this is just, a summary of the kind of general calcium imaging analysis workflow that a neuroscientist would use, but I think most people are trying to study a biological system would use the same kind of approach. Um, it involves things like taking motion out of your images, extracting the data out, figuring out where the cells are and where they aren't. Uh, and Alex and I are happy to discuss this, and I, I figure there's going to be a lot of questions about this, but this is really just a plug for one of these packages. There's tons of open source packages that can do every step of the sequence available to you probably don't need to write any code, uh, and you could have your pick of what's going to be more user-friendly or more uh, uh, what you feel more comfortable interacting with, and I think we can help guide those um, questions as well. So uh, I'll close there and just, you know, leave it up to you guys to ask us some questions that we could hopefully help with.